All right, students, let's go ahead and go over the Chapter 1 PowerPoint, Common Measurements Within Exercise Physiology. Uh, really, this chapter is discussing different assessments within exercise physiology and how we quantify them. And this is anything from quantifying power and work to also determining calorimetry and your VO2 max. Uh, so to start off, I want to discuss the metric system. The metric system is the standard unit of measurement that we use in order to quantify these different outcomes, and it's used to express mass, length, and volume, something that you cannot do with the imperial system. The imperial system is what we use in the United States typically, and that is using feet and pounds and so forth, whereas the metric system is the, uh, I guess, globally accepted system uh, because it's much easier to convert different units. And examples of the metric system would be things like the kilogram and the meter, the centimeter, and so forth. And an extension of the metric system is the system um, of international units, and this is for standardizing units of measurement. If we need to uh, convert things within the metric system, then we can simply move a decimal place, and that's how we can um, more easily calculate things. So here's an example um, of uh, metric prefixes. Um, this is uh, things such as mega, kilo, centi, milli, micro, and so forth. And this is really just denoting the uh, decimal place within the unit. So a mega prefix, that would be denoting a million. Uh, kilo would be a thousand. Um, centi would be one hundredth. And any time we have a metric unit of measurement, um, there's going to be a prefix typically that precedes it, and that gives you an indication of the size of the unit. And again, here's another good table to reference. This will make a little bit more sense when I start talking about quantifying power and work. Um, but whenever we're quantifying human exercise, it's important to understand how we denote mass and distance and time, and make sure that you are always using the kilogram, the meter, and the second. And then once you have those values, you can uh, convert to um, quantifications of work, energy, and power, which is denoted as the joule and the watt. If we were using the imperial system, then we would be unable to calculate the joule and the watt accurately because we're not using a system of international units. If we're trying to use, uh, say, um, a foot, rather than um, a fraction of a meter, then we will not be able to accurately calculate the watt. Also, when we're determining velocity, it's really, in this case, it is a, um, it is a multiplication, and it's meters per second, or I'm sorry, it's a, uh, it's a quotient, um, and this negative one right here is just um, a simpler way to um, state that it is a division, so meters per second is how we um, quantify velocity, and torque um, is newtons meters, meaning it's newtons multiplied by meters. So we're still staying within the metric system, but it's really um, either a quotient or a product of each one of the metrics. All right, so now that we understand the metric system, uh, let's go ahead and talk about our first thing that we commonly assess, and that is just typically the amount of work that you perform. Whenever I am running on a tre uh, treadmill or whenever I am uh, squatting or lifting weights or whatever the case may be, I am always performing some type of work, and we need to measure the amount of work the individual just completed. Um, so work, uh, to put it simply, is force multiplied by distance. Um, so it is a product meaning that we are multiplying um, two values, and that gives us um, a quantified amount of work. Um, in this case, the system of international units um, will be newtons and meters. So anytime I want to know how much work somebody performed, that will be quantified in joules. And like we just talked about, joules is determined based on the amount of newtons multiplied by the amount of meters. So how much force did I produce, and how, how far did that force travel? If I, for example, say I have a barbell that weighs 45 pounds, and I traveled it uh, via bench press uh, the length of my arm, uh, let's say that my arm is one meter. 
and when the barbell goes down, that's one meter of distance, and when the barbell goes back up, that's a second meter of distance. So we first have to um, take the value of the barbell in pounds, convert it to kilograms, and then we multiply it by the force of gravity, and then that's the force and newtons. And I'll talk about that um, a little bit more in detail. Um, but once we have the newton amount, then we take the distance that it traveled, and now we know the amount of work that was performed. So like I said, um, the example right here, it's, it's the same thing I was just saying. If we have 10 kilograms worth of weight, uh, remember that weight is not the same thing as force. So we have to convert this weight into the force. And the way we do that, we already have it in the metric system, which is kilograms. So we multiply 10 kilograms by the force of gravity, which is 9.81, in order to get it in newtons. And then once we have that value, 10 kilograms travel the total distance of two meters. So we multiply the amount of newtons multiplied by the amount of meters, and then we have the amount of joules that was performed or the total amount of work. All right. And this table is also pretty useful. Um, if we performed a certain amount of work on the previous slide, um, if we've determined the amount of work, but we want to know how many calories that was expended as a result of that, we can also use joules as a conversion method to determine the amount of calories that were expended. So for an example, if I did one joule worth of work, that would be uh, 2.39 uh, to the 10th power of 4 uh, kilocalories. So if we know how much work somebody performed, then we can also estimate the amount of calories that were burned. Um, and this tends to be more useful for general populations. If I'm trying to get somebody to perform a certain amount of work, knowing that it results in calorie expenditure, if I tell them that in this workout they did 10,000 joules worth of work, uh, they're really not going to know what to do with that piece of information. So if you tell them instead, well, you burned this amount of joules, or you, um, you did this amount of work, and then it corresponds to this calorie output, then that's typically more understandable for your client or the general population. It's always good to give them a calorie amount because no one is going to understand um, what it means to have performed or worked this, this amount of joules. Okay, so that is work. Um, power, on the other hand, is considered a quotient, and power is really the amount of work over a period of time. So we still quantify it in joules, and we understand that work is force times distance, but now we're quantifying it over a unit of time, and that unit of time is always seconds. Make sure that you don't put minutes or hours it always has to be quantified in seconds. So, for example, if I perform 20,000 joules of work in 60 seconds, then it's a simple, uh, it's a simple calculation of taking 20,000 over 60 seconds, and then power is quantified in watts. So, for example, 20,000 divided by 60 seconds, which is 333 uh, joules per second, or joules per second is also uh, determined as the watt. So again, make sure you're always giving me the watt amount when we're talking about power, and also understand that it's a quotient. Um, but oftentimes, you're not going to be given the total amount of joules that was worked. You're going to be given a force in newtons, you're going to be given the distance, and then you're going to be asked for the power output. So in that case, you need three pieces of information you need the total amount of force, the distance that force traveled, and then divide it by um, the time that it took to perform it. And then we have a watt output. All right, and like I said, very similar to the joule, if I said somebody performed 300 watts, they're not really sure whether or not that's good or that's bad. So sometimes it's simply uh, easier to uh, convert it, in this case, to horsepower. That's usually more understandable, or in kiloponds per meter per minute. So with the watt, um, it can also be um, written as a quotient as one joule per second. Um, one watt is also 6.12 kiloponds, or one horsepower is typically about 745 watts. So again, if I have 
uh, 333 watts, then that is a fraction of one horsepower. Um, sometimes that's a little bit um, easier to understand. Um, if I know that a car has, let's say, 300 horsepower, then that's understandable, more understandable than 50,000 watts for whatever the conversion is. The only place that watts is generally accepted is not so much in the human body, but more so in, in light bulbs and, uh, and electricity. Uh, but in any case, these are some conversions within power. And then we have means of measurement for work and power. Um, and any time we are measuring work and power with a device, that device is called an ergometer. And ergometry is really just a measurement of work output or power output. Um, and an ergometer is any device used to measure that work. And this can be a bench step ergometer, a treadmill, an arm ergometer, or whatever the case may be. But any time we have a device in which we can accurately measure the distance and the force being applied, then we have an ergometer. And it's not just these uh, pieces of cardio equipment or a bench step. Um, really even a, a rack with a barbell, that's also considered an ergometer. Um, it just depends on what you're trying to measure. Okay, and here are some pictures of each device. Um, we have one of these, um, or we have all of these rather, in the Lowenstein lab, um, and the cycle ergometer is really a great way in which we can determine power and also the arm ergometer. Uh, basically one revolution of the pedal multiplied by the force on the flywheel and then divided over a period of time. That's how we're calculating the power output when you pedal at a rapid pace or over an extended period of time. Okay, so here are a few examples. Just make sure you're familiar with some of these calculations of work. Um, again, just make sure you're sticking to the, the, the basic foundation of the formula. If we're, con or if we're uh, calculating work, it is always a product, meaning that it's force times distance. And if we're calculating power, it is always a quotient, meaning that it's work over time. If we are calculating work, we need uh, two total variables. We need the force and we need the distance. If we are calculating power, we need three total variables, meaning we need the force, we need the distance, and we also need a unit of time. If they already have determined the work for you, quantified in joules, then it makes your job uh, much easier. You can easily convert it into watts. But if it's not, if you're given three pieces of information, the force, the distance, and the time, you can still calculate power. And like I said, with cycle ergometry, you're taking into account uh, one more piece of information, and that's the revolution of the pedal and also the distance of one revolution. So if I am pedaling for a period of time on a cycle ergometer, it's not sufficient to say that I have performed a certain amount of newtons and I did so for 10, min uh, 10 minutes. We're not determining the correct amount of distance. So because it's stationary, how do we determine the distance performed on the cycle ergometer? and we do so by measuring the amount of revolutions. We understand that if a person performed uh, one revolution, one revolution is considered to be six meters. And then we multiply that by the rate in which the person was pedaling. And in this case, they pedaled at 60 revolutions per minute, and they did so for 10 minutes. So we have the distance, and we have uh, the, the rate at which they were pedaling, so we have a more accurate distance. They didn't perform one revolution. They did so at a rate. So really over here we have the force, which is the force being applied to the flywheel. The force on the flywheel is 14.7 newtons. And this portion all the way to this portion, this is determining the distance. This is the distance of one revolution. This is the rate of revolutions. And this is the amount of time. So this is all just speaking to the distance, and we multiply it all together, and then we have the uh, amount of joules performed. If we want to determine power out of that, well, we simply take the amount of work performed and divide it by the time in seconds.
So what's important to note here, um, a common mistake is somebody will take the total work and because they're multiplying by time right here, they think that they're also calculating power. But remember that power is always a quotient. It is not a product. Right here when we're calculating work, that is one large product. And this product right here, 6 meters, 60 revolutions per minute for 10 minutes, that is all just denoting the distance. If we want to take power, we have to remember to divide by the total amount of time. Up here you multiplied by the time and then you divide by the time over the, uh, or I'm sorry, under the total amount of work and then we have the watt amount. So don't take make the mistake of thinking that just because we've incorporated time in the calculation that we've also calculated power. It is always a quotient. And then treadmill calculation of work, um, it's a little bit different than cycle ergometry. Again, because it's considered stationary, we have to take into account a couple of things. Um, but treadmills are complicated because we can't technically calculate the work unless we have a vertical rise of the treadmill. If it is considered um, horizontal displacement, then there is none in theory. We haven't traveled any distance, meaning that we can't calculate work. Um, with a cycle ergometer, we have a, rev um, a revolution that we can calculate, a distance with that revolution. With a treadmill, I'm technically not traveling anywhere, and there's no distance that I can use for my calculation. However, if there's a vertical rise of the treadmill, then we're considered to be traveling a vertical rise, and I'll explain that more here in a minute. But the treadmill calculation of work, uh, calculation of work performed while a subject runs or walks on a treadmill is not generally possible when the treadmill is horizontal. And like I said, it's because there's technically no distance that you are traveling and therefore there's no work. So quantifiable work is being performed when the walking or running, when they are walking or running up a slope. So if there is a vertical rise to the treadmill or it's put at a 10% grade, that is denoting a certain amount of distance that the individual has traveled. So, for example, if the treadmill is put at a 10% grade, that means that there is a 10 meter vertical rise for 100 meters of belt travel. Once we have that distance determination, then we can multiply it by the force of the individual, which in, off, which in most cases is just their body mass, and then we're able to determine work. And this is how we determine the grade of the treadmill. Uh, most treadmills, if they are able to increase in their, in their incline, they're just going to simply display what the grade is at. So if I click the incline a few times, it'll say you're now at a 2% grade or a 3% grade or what have you. Um, but if you wanted to calculate it on your own, what you would have to do is to take the angle of the actual incline, which is the rise divided by the hypotenuse, and then you have the grade of the treadmill. Um, that's not something that I would ever require you to do, uh, but just for the sake of theory, um, oftentimes we have to calculate the vertical rise in order to understand exactly how much the person is working on the treadmill, and we do so by taking uh, the rise of the treadmill, which is just the entire distance from apex to ground, and then divided by the hypotenuse. Okay, so the treadmill calculation of work, again, here's an example. Um, you can just kind of read through um, a few of these on your own. Um, but I'll go ahead and explain the first one. Again, if we're trying to calculate work, again, remember that it is a product, so we need two things. We need the force and we need the distance. And we understand that with distance, the only way we can calculate distance on a treadmill is if there's a vertical rise. So the first thing, well, here's the information that we're given. We have the force, which is the mass of the individual. And this is nice, they've already converted it to Newtons for us. So you have 60 kilograms, multiply that by 9.81, and then we have the force in Newtons. So we have a 588 Newton subject, we have the speed of the treadmill, which is 200 meters per minute, and we have a 7.5 grade for um, 10 minutes on the treadmill. Okay, So again, 
this is a product, so we're multiplying the values that we have. And we have to first determine the vertical displacement of the treadmill, which is the percent of the grade multiplied by the distance. Okay, So we take the vertical displacement, which is uh, 200 meters uh, per minute, multiplied by the grade. We understand that it's 7.5%, it's so we have to put that into a decimal, which is 0 0.075 and then we multiply that by the total time because we have a unit of time over here as well, or we have a rate, rather. So we have 200 meters minutes multiplied by the grade and then multiplied by the time, and then we have 150 meters. Now we have a distance that we can use in the product. So we take that 150 meters, we multiply it by the mass of the individual, and in this case it's the force, 588 newtons multiplied by 150 meters, now we've quantified work. And that's, uh, that's typically where you can stop. As long as you have it in joules, then it's a simple conversion into kilopons as long as you're using the conversion table. But remember, we always have to finally have the force multiplied by the distance. With treadmills, we have to first determine the distance by determining the vertical displacement. We have the vertical displacement, then we have the distance, and now we can quantify it. Okay, so that is work and power, um, also using a cycle ergometer and a treadmill as well. Um, a couple other assessments that we use is calorimetry. So the first one that I want you to understand is direct calorimetry, and it is the measurement of heat production as an indication of the metabolic rate. So really, direct calorimetry is just measuring heat production. So it's commonly measured as the kilocalorie or the calorie, and this is denoting the total amount of heat that was produced. So if you're measuring calorimetry, we have to know how many calories were burned or how much heat was produced. Uh, we understand uh, that foodstuffs plus oxygen, that will result and a certain amount of ATP and heat, and that conversion process of foodstuffs will always result in heat production. The calculation of that heat is considered direct calorimetry. Um, but it's very difficult. Um, you have to have a calorimeter in order to do it, which is literally a chamber that is measuring the total amount of heat being produced by the individual. Um, but in most cases, it's commonly measured in calories, and one kilocalorie obviously equals 1,000 calories. But if we have one kilocalorie, that also denotes the total amount of cellular work that was being done. So if I have produced one kilocalorie or produced one kilocalorie worth of heat, then I have done 4,186 joules worth of cellular work. And I know that sounds like not a lot, uh, but again, we're talking about a cellular level here. Okay, and really it's a it's a large device. We don't have one in Lowenstein, but it's really just determining the total amount of heat production based on airflow into the chamber. So airflow into the chamber is being measured, and we're also assessing the temperature within the chamber. And then the airflow out of the chamber is measuring the total amount of heat lost. So based on the total amount of heat lost out of the chamber is the heat being produced by the individual, and then we can determine their basal metabolic rate, or the total amount of calories that they are expending at rest within the chamber. And then there's indirect calorimetry, and this is much more common uh, to be used. Um, it's, it's much cheaper, and you don't have to have a large uh, calorimeter device. Indirect calorimetry is the measurement of oxygen consumption as an estimate of the resting metabolic rate. Um, and this is um, often quantified as your VO2 max. So indirect calorimetry, um, we're taking into account the same variables, but rather than um, determining the amount of heat being produced, we're determining the amount of oxygen consumption by the individual. If we know the volume of oxygen that's being consumed by the individual, then we can indirectly determine the total amount of kilocalories being expended in order to compensate for that oxygen. 
and this is all called open circuit spirometry. It determines your VO2 max by measuring the amount of oxygen consumed, and really the volume of oxygen is determining um, the subtraction of the volume of oxygen inspired um, versus the volume of oxygen expired. So whatever the net difference is there, that's your VO2 max, and if we know the total amount of net oxygen consumed, then we can determine the amount of heat being produced, and if we know the heat that was produced, then we can give a kilocalorie estimation. Okay, and we do have one of these metabolic carts within Lowenstein, and um, again, this is an example of open circuit spirometry. Really, while the individual is pedaling or doing some kind of work, we can calculate the amount of metabolic activity taking place because we're monitoring the amount of oxygen being consumed. Okay, so how do we quantify VO2 um, if we don't necessarily have a mask that's exactly tracking it? Well, it all comes down to four total variables that we need in order to determine VO2 and that is a 60 kilogram subject, uh, the ventilation of the individual, inspired oxygen, and then expired oxygen. So remember that we have to have the VO2, and then we can take into account the total amount of oxygen consumption, and then we have a quantifiable VO2 over here. So you take the inspired amount minus the expired amount, and then multiply the rate at which oxygen was consumed, and then we have their VO2 max. Um, and again, in this case, if a person is breathing 60 liters of oxygen per minute, and we take the fraction of inspired versus expired, then they were uh, consuming oxygen at a rate of 2.4 liters per minute. Uh, and you can also um, determine that or uh, quantify it as kilocalories per minute. That's an option as well. If we know the individual's VO2, then we can determine the, the kilocalories or the calories that they burned. Um, so again, if they have, um, well, anytime we're talking about VO2, uh, one VO2, that's a strange way of putting it, the person's VO2 at rest is always 2.4 liters per minute. That's the standard resting rate. Um, one liter of oxygen results in five kilocalories per liter. And it ranges from 4.7 to 5.05, uh, depending on whether or not we are primarily burning fat versus burning carbohydrates. Uh, that's taking into account bioenergetics and what type of activity they are doing, uh, but typically we're staying within this range. Um, we're very rarely uh, using protein or some kind of other substrate within this uh, VO2 max calculation, but we're always going between 4.7 uh, kilocalories being burned per liter of oxygen to 5.05 uh, kilocalories uh, per liter of oxygen. So 2.5 liters per minute multiplied by 5 kilocalories, um, that's just taking the rate uh, multiplying by the conversion factor, and that's 12 kilocalories per minute. And then if we have that amount, 12 kilocalories, then we can take that amount over the total amount of activity or the time um, the individual is exercising, which in this case is 30 minutes, and then we have an estimation of how many calories they burned in that exercise, which in this case is 360 calories. Okay, and here's another example. Um, if we have the VO2 of the individual, and now we also have their body weight, now we can uh, turn it into a quotient, taking into account the person's body weight, and then we have another way in which we can evaluate VO2. So ultimately, we want to quantify VO2 while taking into account the person's body weight. If we don't take into account their body weight, yes, it's still considered their VO2 max, but it's not as accurate. It's not taking into account the size of the, the individual. It's only taking into account uh, the total amount of oxygen. So when we use their body weight, the formula is taking the VO2 max of the individual, uh, multiplying by 1,000 milliliters per liter, and then you divide by 60 kilograms, or the mass of the individual. And then in this case, we have 
40 mLs per kg per minute. Um, and again, we have two rates here. We have uh, the rate of time in which the individual was consuming oxygen, which is um, 1,000 milliliters per liter, and then that's in a 60 kilogram individual. So it's kind of strange. It's mLs divided by kgs divided by minutes. Uh, but in any case, that's how we prefer to determine somebody's VO2. And oftentimes you're going to see metabolic equivalents um, being used as the standard for VO2 max. If we tell somebody their VO2 max, um, very similar to telling somebody their joule output or their power output, you have to give them kind of a more understandable unit of measurement. And in this case, we've determined it to be the resting metabolic rate. So at rest, um, or at somebody's resting metabolic rate, they are always expending one met per minute. And one met per minute is quantified as 3.5 milliliters per kg per minute, meaning that at rest, a human needs 3.5 milliliters per kilogram of body weight per minute in order to maintain functioning. So this whole process, measuring the amount of oxygen consumed based on the mass of the individual, that's considered to be one metabolic equivalent, or one met. So how do we determine somebody's met? Um, it's simply a matter of dividing by one metabolic equivalent. If we have somebody's volume of oxygen, 40 ml per kg per minute, then we take that value and then we convert it to mets by dividing it by one met. So 40 mls per kg per minute divided by one met, or 3.5, then we have 11.4 mets. So if I ever give you somebody's VO2 and I say, well, how many mets did they expend, or what was their resting metabolic rate while performing that activity, then once you convert it, then you should be able to tell me. You should be able to divide it by 3.5 and then tell me that amount in METs. And here we have another uh, unit of measurement. This is the kilocalorie per kilogram per hour. And this is something that you usually use if it's a very long activity, meaning that this is, if this is exercise where we're using a combination of carbohydrates and fats and we need to control for that variance, then that's when we use this unit of measurement. Uh, and again, here's an example. Um, if you have some ice VO2 and you know the amount of kilocalories per liter of oxygen, then we can determine kilocalories per kilogram per hour. And here's the calculation down here. If we have their VO2, then we multiply it by the rate, which is 60 minutes per hour, um, or 60 minutes per hour, which is, which is one hour. Then we have 2,400 milliliters per kg per hour. So really it's just a matter of multiplying it by the standard of time to convert it, or we could also do it in liters rather than milliliters, multiply it by the kilocalorie amount, and then we have the desired unit of measurement, which is kilocalories per kg per hour. Okay, so this is all just to say that we have an estimation of energy expenditure. The reason that these things are necessary is because we have to be able to determine how much energy is being expended, and especially, especially in instances of weight loss or weight gain, we're always in a state of energy balance and understanding what is the energy expenditure with different activities. If we want to be in a net negative energy balance, then we need to understand exactly how much energy we're expending while exercising. So the energy cost of horizontal treadmill, walking or running, for example, um, the oxygen requirement increases as linear function of speed. So for example, uh, walking um, quantified in your VO2, the total amount of oxygen being consumed, this can be quantified or determined uh, based